so welcome everyone. Uh, you're here at the special meeting of, of the, the two technical advisory committees of the Turlock Sub Basin. Um, yeah, a couple of quick reminders. You see them there on your screen. Just try not to put the call on hold. Uh, mute if you wish to mute until you wish to speak, uh, or go on mute until you wish to speak, and unmute when when needed. Um, we'll have comment periods. Uh, we always do. Um, there's a public comment uh, public comment item um, for those matters not listed on the agenda, and then there's uh, always a good amount of time to comment on items that are listed on the agenda. Um, of note too, um, there's a raise hand feature. Um, Zoom's been, you know, updating a lot of stuff and things are been kind of moved, but um, inside the um, reactions uh, little tab you have on your Zoom display, you'll find a, if you click reactions, you'll find a couple different reactions, but you'll also see a raise hand feature in there. You can feel free and use that too at any time and we'll try and spot you and get you a chance to speak if you don't uh, already just jump in and ask a question. Um, we're recording the meeting. It's going to be posted afterwards uh, as soon as we get it rendered on YouTube. And then also meeting materials are going to be available on uh, turlockgroundwater.org uh, afterward. We have Phyllis's presentation up there already and any other items as well. So with that being said, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll hand over to, to Kevin and Karen to run their meeting. Thank you, Herb. Yeah, so to remind everybody, this is the West Turlock Subbasin GSA Technical Advisory Committee and the East Turlock uh, Subbasin GSA Technical Advisory Committee special meeting of February 11th, uh, 2021. And it's just uh, 2.03 on my clock. So, so welcome. Uh, the first thing uh, we usually do is call a meeting to order and see if we have a a roll call. And I, I see Brody is on and Walt is on. Is that correct for the east side? There's Walt. Yep, yep Brody's here and, and Lacey's here as well from the east, Kevin. Okay, super. So we have a quorum on the east side. Karen, do you want to check the quorum on the, the west side? There we go. Let me unmute. City of Turlock? Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. City of Turlock? TID? You have Herb here. Okay, I, we have Debbie too as well, right? Yeah, I see her on. She might not be speaking, but I do see her on the participant list. Okay, I'm here for City of Siri. Yes, City of Houston. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> City of Houston. City of Modesto. I'm here, Karen Miguel. Delhi Community Water District. Denaire Community Service District. Here, Richard Lindo. And then Hillmar Community Water District. Stanislaus County, Walt, you're here, correct? Yes. <clears throat> Merced County. Yeah, you got Brody here and I think Lacey's on Brody. as well. Okay, City of Waterford. Here. Is that Michael Pitcock? Yep. Keys Community Service District. Okay, that's it for our side. Thank you, Karen. So we have a quorum on the uh, West Turlock Subbasin and the East Turlock Subbasin GSA. Uh, usually we approve the minutes at this time. Um, those on the East, have you had a chance to look at the minutes and have any suggested changes or would you like to make a motion to approve the minutes of January 28th meeting. Ms. Walt, I move approval. And I'll second that, Kevin. Okay. Walt and Brody made the motion. Any discussion? 
Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any, aye. any against? Hearing none against, the motion passes unanimously. Karen, would you like to address the west side? Sure. Can we get a motion to approve the minutes? Hi, this is Debbie. Oh. The TV. I, 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 I'd move to approve the minutes. Um, I, I will note that um, the, the minutes on the agenda are called special meeting minutes, but it, it was a regular meeting. But the minutes themselves say a regular meeting. So just for clarification. Okay. A second for anyone? I'll second Richard Lindo. Okay. So that's the two. So uh, do we have any opposed? And a vote to pass, everybody say aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. Thank you, Karen. Um, moving to item five, public participation. This is the time set aside for members of the public to directly address the technical advisory committees on any item of interest to the public that is within this subject matter uh, jurisdiction of the TAC and to address the TAC on any items on the posted agenda. Uh, you will be allowed five minutes for your comments. If you wish to speak regarding any item on the agenda, you may be asked to defer your remarks until the technical advisory committee addresses the matter. No action or discussion uh, may be taken on any item not appearing on the posted agenda. So at this time, is there anybody that's on the Zoom meeting here, the virtual meeting that we're having today that would like to make a comment? Please announce yourself before your comment. I think that's enough time. So there's no public comment. I'll move on to item six, the budget. Is Mr. Clipper on the line? Hi, this is Debbie. Um, Mr. Clipper wasn't able to make it today, but um, he conveyed that there aren't any significant changes and that he'll report at the next meeting. Okay, very good. Any, any questions for Debbie on that? Hearing none, I'll report on the East Turlock Subbasin GSA. Uh, the board has not met since we uh, the TAC met last time, so there's nothing new to report on the uh, East Turlock Subbasin GSA's uh, financials at this time either. Are there any questions about that? Okay, then I'll move on to item seven, the ad hoc committee. Uh, discussion in po possible direction from the joint TAC regarding the creation of an ad hoc committee to participate in technical discussions and provide policy recommendations to the TAC. Debbie, you have a presentation? Yes, thank you, Kevin. Um, at the last TAC meeting, we talked a little bit about how to move uh, the process forward. Um, Phyllis uh, has been really great at talking about the technical side of the SIGMA process and um and and you know different different options that we might have um but there's a need to kind of uh talk and maybe develop a recommendation for the TAC to consider with respect to policy related issues and so the idea was to develop an ad hoc committee of the TAC members that would help facilitate that process um and uh, it would enable some uh, coordination between the TAC meetings to help facilitate those recommendations. And, um, and so the idea would be that uh, the ad hoc committee would meet um, in between the TAC meetings with Phyllis and work through some of the technical and policy issues and ask her additional questions and, and then bring both items both the technical as well as policy recommendations from the ad hoc committee 
to the TAC um, to discuss further and and um, uh, and develop uh, decisions and recommendations to then take to the GSAs as we move forward. So, so that's the concept. Um, and so it would require that the TAC establish this ad hoc committee, um, and uh, and then each of the the TACs would um, identify members of that ad hoc committee. Um, the, the desire is to perhaps make it uh, smaller than a Brown Act requirement, um, simply because that it would facilitate the ability to um, meet quickly and, and work through things and, and, and what have you. And then of course, bring it back to the TAC um, for, for everyone to, to consider uh, in, a, in a public setting. Um, so, so that's the concept. I'd be happy to answer any questions there might be. Um, sorry, I tech members have, go, go ahead and announce yourself and if you have any questions. Debbie, I'll ask one. Um, sure. The I, I think this is a great idea, number one. Um, number two, um, could it operate kind of similar to how we've been having the meeting planning sessions? Is that what? Yes. So that's, that's a little bit of the concept. Actually, I, I, what I would like to do um, is, is, is um, schedule a regular meeting of the ad hoc group um, right before the planning call. So um, the planning calls have been about 3.30 on um, either the Monday or the Tuesday following the TAC meeting to schedule the agenda and what have you. And so if we have the planning call before that, like at three, um, and then we can have a very short planning call because uh, you know it'll just be what, what items do we need to put on the agenda and, and move on. And so we'd be making, I think, better use of that time and getting some, um, some real direction as we move forward. And some agencies have already kind of allocated some of that time to this process anyway, and so they might work better for their schedule. And then, of course, we would have perhaps other meetings in between that if there's a need to follow up on items and what happened before the staff meeting, but yes, that's the concept. Does that help? Yeah, that helps me, uh, Debbie. I, hey, Debbie, I, this is Walt. Um, go ahead, Walt. How, how would you consider making an appointment to this committee without creating a committee that's as big as the TAC? In other words, the TAC is represented by each and every member agency, but I can't perceive the ad hoc kind of being in the same structure, but so how do you do that? Well, the concept was to um, to hopefully incorporate a, a wide cross section of the entities that are engaged with the GSAs and the tax. And so, um, for the west side, um, we'd want to have um, agencies that represent ag as well as urban and both like uh, larger urban and smaller urban and perhaps a county. The complication is that the counties are in both GSAs. So um, we would wanna see whom um, the East Turlock folks kind of identify. And then we can build the West Turlock um, portion of it. Does that make sense? Um, but again, the idea was to, you know, make it a little smaller and, and more nimble to um, facilitate some some concepts and recommendations that would then come back to a larger group. So, so we're not trying to preclude conversation. We're trying to move some ideas forward and develop some concepts that we could bring back to the larger group. Yeah. There's so much I have 
go through between now and then, but, you know, having that ability might be helpful. Hi, hi, Debbie, this is Lacey. Um, I like this idea um, of, of having a, an, an actual kind of a committee that's char or an ad hoc committee that's charged for a, a short period of time of, of making these recommendations. I don't want to speak for a Walt, but I, I think the counties should be involved. And I would think that maybe um, Stanislaw County and Merced County could, maybe Walt and I could work together to maybe alternate at some of these meetings when one can't be at, can't be at, uh, the, the other county could attend because we do have um, a restriction with the number of, of members that can be there from the east for LOCTAC and I think we're restricted at just two. So I know we wouldn't, I, I would assume we would not want both counties there because then um, none of the other members from the East Turlock Subbasin GSA could be there, but maybe we could have it one county and Walt and I could, and Brody could work together um, to make sure we're, we're not both attending or we're not both not attending. Walt, would that work for you? Hey, yeah, and Lacey, that's a good idea because both counties are also both members of the East and the West. So by us being a member of this ad hoc, by us, I mean the two shared two counties, uh, we would sort of be, I suppose, representing both East and West. Yeah. The other question, so, I would have, Debbie, and go ahead, Kevin. If nobody else has a question, is do we have to have a formal um, structure? Um, I, I I don't know if we need a formal structure, and, and perhaps um, so long as um, we stay under the requirement, you know, because because we don't want to get into a brown up issue. Um, so, uh, I, I don't know how best to do that. On the West side, there's, there's a little more flexibility because, um, we could have up to, to six, um, agencies participating at any one time, um, without running into a, a, a an yeah. issue. Um, I, I would not encourage one. I just was want to make, yeah, want yeah. to make sure you didn't have anything on, in mind. I mean, ad hoc by definition means, you know, informal. To and by, sure. sorry, Kevin, this is Valerie Kincaid. Um, I mean, the important thing is that this committee kind of assign or appoint that committee. You don't have to say who's on it and when they're gonna meet and all that kind of stuff. You can kind of just say, you know, we're gonna have to be dynamic that this, this group is um, ad hoc in the sense that it's dealing with the, um, the uh, technical recommendations that it has to be made to the GSP so long as you don't run into a quorum issue because then you're really making decisions there. Um, you, you know, you can appoint it and say, we'll leave it open, open membership and, and kind of however it works. But there's, there's a question. Um, no, it would not be open to the public um, because in order to make it open to the public, you have to not only provide notice and agenda and all the documents, but any recommendations coming out of that group would be made public and to this TAC, and then they would be made public again when they go to the board. So it's not a lack of transparency. There'll be plenty of transparency, but we're running into an issue where we need, um, you know, a lot of feedback on technical issues and um, we need to move that ball forward. So there, there's going to be direction um, to this committee and then up to the board. But yeah, that is the purpose of an ad hoc. It's kind of work nimbly. Thank you. So it's a question of timeliness mostly. And, yeah, and I think so. I mean, that 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 looming date of, of plan development and the fact that we haven't had chapters out yet and we don't have um, you know SMCs, you know that that's it's going to be January went by too quickly for me, maybe, but it's going to be here tomorrow. <laughs>
I fully support it. Let's if, give it a shot. Try it out. Like trying on a pair of clothes. I mean, we just can't trigger um, the qualms. Correct. I agree, Walt. Well. You know, I, I see so, it operating. This is Kevin again. I see it operating as a uh, in, in a similar manner as as the uh, meeting planning group. Yeah. Recall we have those meetings once a month. Yeah. And uh, I, I see it operating like that, uh, with like Valerie said, being nimble enough that if the Todd team needs us to meet on a specific issue, we could set a time quickly, meet on it get it on any agenda, discuss it, get it on the agenda so we can present it to the entire TAC. I think it's a good idea. Is it subject to formal action motion and second and all that by both East and West? Yes, as I Back understand it, it would require a, a formal action to establish the committee. Yeah. And, and you don't, like I said, you don't have to establish the people on it, but I think you need to establish the committee and give it enough direction, which I think we've had through this discussion. But it would be helpful to have um, a motion and a second from both sides. But Valerie, can we have a, a joint uh, motion from the East and West? Um, you guys can, can do it at the same time, but remember they're two entities. So maybe two people make a motion, one from each. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Will two people on the east side make a motion to, as uh, shown on the agenda and for the discussion today? This is Dennis. I will make a motion to format a committee. And a second? Well, I didn't hear Dennis's motion. Uh, Dennis's motion was to, uh, per the discussion we just had, go ahead and establish the okay. agenda as suggested on the agenda. Okay, I'll, I'll second that. Very good. So as moved by uh, Dennis, seconded by Walt. You wanna ask for a motion on your side, Karen? Yes, can I get a motion? So I'll motion. motion, Richard. How about a second? I'll second it, Miguel. Thank you, Miguel. Okay, so we have two motions. Any further discussion in terms of these motions? Hearing none, I'll ask for the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye, both from the east and the west. Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Hearing none, the motion, the motion passes unanimously, both for the East and the West. Uh, thank you for that discussion. And Debbie, maybe we have a discussion offline as to who the appointees should be. Um, yes, uh, that, that would be great. And, and frankly, um, you know, I would appreciate it from the West side if people would um, let me know if they have a burning interest to participate or we'll reach out to you <laughs> to say, hey, will you will you come and, and, and participate? We do need to, um, I think, have good representation from the different interest groups and, and um, we, we have a, a better uh, product. So, um, so please reach out to me and let me know. Thanks. And there was, I, I would reflect that. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, couldn't have said it better. On the east side, I feel the same way. So please get in touch with me if you have a burning interest in being appointed. Thank you. Any further discussion of item seven? Okay, I'll move on to item eight. Presentation from the consultant team regarding the development of a monitoring well network, a requirement of the groundwater sustainability plan. And this is gonna be presented by Phyllis Staten of, of Todd Groundwater. Phyllis? Thank you, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. Can everyone see my screen? Just somebody give me a thumbs up there. Great, thank you very much. All right, so um, thank you very much also to the uh, tax for considering the ad hoc committee. I think it's a great idea. And because we are a little behind schedule and we're getting uh, you know, a little pushed from a variety of things, uh, I think this is gonna be really helpful. And so to that end, 
uh, recognizing that we're going to immediately start working with the new ad hoc committee for the sustainable management criteria, continuing those discussions uh, among the, um, the group, and also recognizing that the ad hoc committee also affects the schedule. Uh, I thought today we would be uh, well served to review some details on putting together our GSP monitoring network. In particular, we talked about that a little bit last time, and I think there was a little bit of confusion. So I wanted to just sort of clear the air and just take a breath and just talk about monitoring wells in the subbasin and where we might go with the GSP uh, network. And then um, moving from there into some uh, information on a revised GSP schedule to get us moving forward. So with that in mind, um, let's continue through the slides here. So we're on agenda item number eight first, talking about the groundwater uh, monitoring well network. Um, there are a variety of considerations and selection criteria that one might make for uh, putting together a GSP monitoring network, and they are uh, some of the things that we've discussed in the past, and they're also uh, uh, well documented by DWR and their BMPs. But today, I want to focus on thinking about um, not only a, a water level monitoring network per se, but also uh, what do we need to select MTs, uh, minimum thresholds. And in particular, continuing that discussion of chronic lowering of water levels last week, we talked about how that might be done. And regardless of how we end up putting that MT uh, component together, it's still helpful if the wells that we're doing that for are uh, wells that have some sort of representation of historical water levels so that we can see how water levels have fluctuated in the past in that vicinity and whether it's, uh, you know, the MT is selected at uh, a minimum threshold of a historic low or some level different than that. Um, it helps to kind of have that frame of reference. So thinking about that and thinking about what else we need to uh, know with respect to a, uh, a representative monitoring well, which is what I'm calling the wells that we might think about designated as MTs, um, uh, we, we certainly need access. <laughs> and I put that first, recognizing if we can't get to the well, it really doesn't matter how great of a well it is, we need to be able to uh, incorporate that well and access that well going forward. Um, we would like to have a historical water level record, as I had just mentioned. We want to consider subbasin coverage and the areas of changes and areas of declines. And we would love to have dedicated monitoring wells rather than active production wells, just to be able to avoid not being able to measure when the well is pumping and to avoid inefficiencies of that well, making us think that the water levels are declining in the aquifer when in reality, they're just declining in that one well. And so um, those are the criteria that I think about. There's certainly other criteria that we can consider, um, but I, I wanted to focus on these because I think it helps frame uh, where we stand now and where we're gonna go with respect to getting representative monitoring wells. Um, so I, was, I, would, I would think uh, some control over their construction is important too. Absolutely. Words, we have good control over their total depth and their screen interval. Um, so we know what aquifer they're tapping. Clearly, clearly. And, and, and thank you for that. I, I think we could, we could make that list even longer if we thought about it for a while. Um, part of the reason construction isn't on there is because I'm going to be dealing with uh, wells where we pretty much know the construction information. But we're going to We'll, we'll continue to focus in on principal aquifers as we go forward for sure. Um, so thinking about water level records, I, I tried to think about, well, you know, is it necessary that there be a complete record? What, it, what does complete mean? If you miss a few years, it uh, depends on what years they are. If you're doing semi-annual monitoring versus just a point here and there, can those, uh, can those water level points be readily connected. And so, you know, obviously preferred. What do you want if you could just have it? The answer would be a complete historical record period from 1991 to the present. Okay, so, and if we don't have that, it, it would still be helpful if we had some information on records uh, during the recent drought. Uh, certainly historical low levels might control how we think about how we end up 
uh, selecting an MT. So uh, the, the historical low levels from the drought would be 2013 through 2019, for example. Uh, that would be a, a time period that would be most helpful. And, and at a minimum, it would also be, you know, sort of uh, good to be able to see how that well has fluctuated over time from wet years to drought. So um, th those are the just, you know, off the top of my head, some considerations. There are many more. Um, I, this is not a complete list, but I just thought it would get us going with respect to the discussion today. Was there a comment on this slide that we wanted to uh, stop and take a question on? Okay, I'm sorry, I think I was hearing things. Okay, so um, I recognize fully, and, and I know all of you do as well, because we've talked about this, that the attributes are going to be different for the different sustainability indicators. We have been talking about the chronic lowering of water levels, and that's what I'm sort of focused on with respect to a uh, helpful, long, relatively long and complete water level record, and certainly good sub-basin coverage would be preferred. Um, and, and again, numerous other attributes. Uh, at Walt's point with construction is very good. We would like to see you know, a, a representative number in each of the principal aquifers, for example, and, and et cetera. So, um, but, but generally just focusing on the main things that, that I wanted to pull in today, um, the complete water levels and basin coverage would be the most helpful, I think, for the chronic lowering of water levels. Uh, reduction of groundwater and storage, we haven't uh, decided how that monitoring network might look. The guidance actually says that rather than doing it at uh, discrete monitoring points, you might do it as a volume uh, of uh, reduction of storage. And so there's a variety of ways to think about this, but we could also use a subset of the water level data wells uh, above, I would think would be helpful, uh, supplemented by, of course, other uh, considerations. For degraded water quality, we've talked about the need and the, uh, the desire to coordinate and confer with the existing water quality monitoring programs. So we would want to consider where they are already monitoring uh, to give us a good understanding of sort of the coverage that uh, already exists in there. And again, supplemented by other monitoring well sites as needed. Um, the, the water level record would be helpful there but perhaps not as uh, necessary as in other areas. I mean, as, as for other sustainability criteria. Uh, for land subsidence, we've talked a bit about monitoring for land subsidence, obviously wanting well screens in the Western lower principal aquifer, as well as the upper uh, principal aquifer. We already have a lot of the shallower wells in place uh, and uh, less numbers of wells for the Western lower principal aquifer. Uh, we may not need long historical records at these monitoring sites, although it's always helpful. But um, we've talked about setting a minimum threshold based on some uh, level or elevation related to the corker and clay at those sites. So it would not necessarily be um, uh, you know, a deal breaker if we had a new well, uh, as long as we know where the corker and clay is and we're able to monitor water levels efficiently, we could be able to have um, that well incorporated into a land subsidence network. Um, and then for interconnected surface water, uh, a little bit different uh, um, uh, animal for this sustainability indicator. Uh, long and complete water level records would be helpful, but the key there is that we are looking for relatively shallow wells and along the river boundaries would be preferred. So I only put this up to just demonstrate that there's a variety of ways of looking at your monitoring network for each one of these sustainability indicators. But I think if we put some time and energy into the uh, water level monitoring network for at least the first sustainability indicator, we're, we're um, you know, more than half the way home with respect to having a robust monitoring program. And so uh, to that end, I put together um, a map here of variety of existing monitoring programs. Uh, you can see that they're listed on the right, the CASGEM program, the uh, CASGEM voluntary wells, also associated with the CASGEM program. And then the East Chilliwack Subbasin GSA in particular has developed a variety of networks of potential network of potential monitoring well candidates, including a, a network of 24 wells uh, that they've shared with us on a, on a 
uh, you know, a, a draft basis as they're putting this uh, information together. They've also uh, had some opportunity to, to do some monitoring in private wells uh, owned by Olam and East uh, Side Water District. And so those wells have been added to the map again for completeness here. Um, the, um, there are agencies uh, in the central portion of the basin that have drilled uh, and installed multi-depth, multi-completion wells at five locations. We're gonna talk about those. Uh, those give us the opportunity to actually do vertical gradients in the sub-basin. So they're uh, a, a very helpful piece of the puzzle. And then finally, uh, USGS has existing wells along the Merced River and uh, one in the east side um, area. And we're gonna just look at a map and talk about those as well. And then finally, uh, in addition to all of these existing wells, we have uh, firm plans for additional future wells. There are three wells that have been cited um, and dedicated for installation under the Department of Water Resources Technical Services Support Program, that TSS program. So they've been added to this map, along <clears throat> with our recent grant that we received under Prop 68, to install additional monitoring wells. Uh, there are seven wells at six locations. The, I mean, I'm sorry, at five locations. Um, and the wells have been more uh, accurately sited in the eastern uh, portion of the subbasin and in the western portion of the subbasin. You can see three candidate locations shown by the red dashed lines. So essentially, what we're looking at here are maps of wells that have been accessed by agencies within this basin already for monitoring water levels at least, a, at least once. And some of them um, have already uh, achieved uh, you know, access for ongoing monitoring. So there are, there are more than 100 wells on this map already. So I think we're in pretty good shape with respect to pulling subsets of these wells together for the GSP monitoring network. And so what I wanted to do very briefly is to just run through these programs. I just have a map of each one and some of the hydrographs showing the demonstration of the well records uh, associated with some of these wells. So let's just do that quickly for CASGEM. We've just pulled, um, I think there are um, seven hydrographs that we're going to just quickly run through. We've seen some of these before. In fact, we've seen some of these at the very me last meeting before. But I think it just, you know, just gives us an idea. I thought my idea for this meeting would just, we would just sit, kind of review the data, take a, a cruise around the subbasin and see as much information and data that we know that we um, have monitored in the past and we can uh, potentially use in the future. So here are some of those, I'm sorry, let's, let, let me back up a second. I didn't even help you let, let you know where we're gonna be headed. So I'm just gonna roam around the basin. We're gonna look at these, Cash gem wells, we're just going to sort of do a, a little bit of a, of a uh, circle, a counterclockwise circle around the basin, looking at some of these shallow wells in the Western Turlock Subbasin, an East Side Water District well, which we've already looked at, another TID well, and then ending up back around um, the subbasin in this area. So uh, this is the uh, a demonstration of the water level record near Ceres and, and the Besto urban pumping with no significant long-term declines. It's near the Tuolumne River where some stream flow depletion has been indicated from some of our modeling. So we'll wanna think about um, uh, monitoring for interconnected surface water in this area. And some recent declines have been correlated by the city of Ceres with water quality issues. So we wanna watch that as well. Um, on these graphs, I have left our little red line, which was our example MT that we talked about before. Um, in this particular case, I think that you can see that this is uh, just sort of a spike and likely related to uh, production either in this well or nearby, and probably wouldn't be representative of an MT, but we just went through to identify the historic low in some of these other wells. So I've just left those lines on the maps for the purposes of this presentation. Um, this, again, moving to this south here, um, this is a, a shallow well west of Keys with a relatively complete record. And so this is what I'm just demonstrating is how many of these wells really have uh, good water level histories that we can use to assist us in some of our sustainable management criteria. Um, in this particular well, it's declined about 20 feet during the recent drought, but it recovered. 
So you can sort of see that, um, that uh, decline and recovery uh, seen at the end of this uh, period uh, in this area here. And continuing on again, uh, a, a well in the uh, shallow uh, water levels of the Western Turlock Subbasin GSA, west of the city of Turlock with relatively stable uh, water levels and some recent very minor declines. Um, moving down to Delhi, this is an, a well near um, areas that some of the domestic well failures had been recorded. Uh, the decline during the drought really was only about 10 feet uh, in this area. And um, this is an, an area where there have been additional recently drilled shallow wells. Uh, moving over into the eastern portion of the West Turlock Subbasin GSA, um, this is the, the northeast area where domestic, water, uh, domestic well impacts were uh, observed during the drought. You can see uh, this is just a, a, another example. So for example, in this well, we don't have, you know, we have a sort of a missing gap here. But, um, you know, the question becomes from a technical perspective, does, is that a deal breaker? Do, what, what, what kind of problems does that occur? Does that give you? And the answer is, is that um, really, uh, it, the, this is the kind of thing that you could work around. You, you do have some hot, the, uh, some water levels during uh, times of relatively wet periods. You certainly have the high from 1998 shown and this entire uh, cycle going through uh, the wet conditions in 2005. And then you have periods of drought. And you can always pull and look at uh, hydrographs in other areas to give you some kind of an understanding about what happened during this period. So it doesn't mean just because you don't have a complete perfect record that you don't have a good understanding of what is going on in that well. And, and obviously you can continue to use it for your GSP monitoring network. And this could even be a representative monitoring well if you just decided that we needed that. Um, and that yes. John here, do you know how deep that well is? Uh, yes, I do, but not off the top of my head. We do have the um, construction data for the CASGEN wells. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, and then we have uh, a well shown here uh, in the eastern portion of the West Turlock Subbasin GSA with a little bit more of a water level decline during the drought and a complete record. So again, um, something that, that helps us understand what's going on in that area. But we've looked at this one before. This is the uh, cash gem well that Eastside Water District monitors. And even though, uh, again, it's, a, it's likely a production well, you can tell from looking at those spikes um, that you see, when you see that kind of uh, fluctuation, it's typically related to pumping water levels. And as a result of that, you don't exactly know what's going on in the aquifer. So you'd prefer to have a non-pumping well in the network. But uh, nonetheless, even though it's a, a, it, it is incomplete in some time periods, I still think you can still uh, understand what's going on with respect to water level declines. I'm uh, hearing someone else's conversation. So if someone could mute, I won't be talking with you. <laughs> um, Okay, so that was the CASGEN program. And now just looking at the voluntary wells, which is also part of the CASGEN program, uh, there are 32 additional monitoring wells uh, in this program. Uh, and, and really they have uh, in some ways more complete water level records than some of the CASGEN wells do, uh, especially in the East Turlock Subbasin GSA. So we've just pulled uh, five hydrographs from uh, that area and they're shown uh, by the labels here. Um, just to demonstrate the relatively complete records that we see from some of the voluntary wells. So this is um, one of them in the northwestern portion of the Easter Alexa Basin GSA. Um, you can see that there is more frequent monitoring in recent years. Uh, I suspect um, uh, that's the just the, the continued and ongoing efforts uh, for the Easter Alexa Basin GSA because I know they've put a lot of time and energy into monitoring uh, their monitoring networks uh, in the area. But again, uh, you know, a good complete uh, water level record throughout the entire historical study period uh, to the present. Uh, again, another well, this is close to the, to the other well. This is also a well, when you see this label here, um, I've, I've borrowed from 
uh, some of the well designations that the East Turlock Subbasin GSA already is using. This indicates that this is in their current uh, monitoring network that's been identified uh, in, in the, for the East Turlock Subbasin GSA. So this is, uh, just happened to be one of those wells that is also a cash gem voluntary well and thereby has a, a nice complete record uh, in the area. I, I don't know the, the status um, of this well. I, I put here that I noticed these rather large fluctuations. Perhaps that's reflected of an active pumping well, but um, I, I don't know very much about the well. But at any rate, um, we have a complete water level record indicated throughout the entire historical period. And um, this is also close to these other, the other two hydrographs that we just looked at. And again, a complete record throughout the historical study period. And um, one more, uh, actually two more. There's this one is um, uh, moving to the south. There are two in the southern portion of the East Turlock Subbasin GSA and the voluntary cash and voluntary program. Uh, this one again, a complete well record with more frequent water uh, level monitoring in recent years. And finally, the last one uh, that I've pulled, which is the, uh, a, an additional one. Uh, again, seeing this large downward spike, something that you'd want to avoid if you were going to assign uh, minimum thresholds to uh, historic low levels, um, likely related to pumping, but again, not sure of the status of this well. Um, the well, it's John here. It's worth saying for everybody's sake, if you or your staff have any questions about these that we're monitoring, just give us a call. Yeah, so we have no questions from now. We're, we're putting everything, you know, I thought this would be a really helpful time to just begin to pull everything together and uh, give us an understanding of what programs are out there and what wells are in those programs. Uh, and as we begin, to, you know, the, the, first, the first thought is, you know, what do we really have? And then the second thought is, okay, well, let's select the best that we can from this area, uh, not only for the GSP monitoring network, but also for representative wells. Sure. And then um, focusing in on these Trill like Subbasin GSA monitoring program for just one moment, I, I, uh, I know that East Trill like Subbasin GSA is, has been monitoring at least since 2019. So I'm sure there are more water level data uh, than I have compiled so far, but there's one well that actually was in the water data library. So we do have one hydrograph just to demonstrate that even though these are relatively newly monitored wells, we do have a historical record for at least one of them. Uh, it does, however, end in 2013. So um, I'm not sure if, they're, if we're monitoring this now, if we've picked it up, but um, you know, again, uh, sort of filling in some of these gaps will be helpful with respect to better understanding and selecting wells that might be good minimum threshold wells. Moving uh, now to the uh, multi-port uh, monitoring wells that um, have been drilled yep. for some of the uh, municipalities. Did, did someone have a question? Yeah, sorry, this is Debbie. Um, yeah. So I had a question for you for, um, Oh, a couple of slides back, you had another map that showed all of voluntary wells. Yes. There you go. Um, on the west side, are those DWR monitored wells? Because um, I don't think on TASJAM, TID has any specific voluntary wells listed. So it, it could be well that DWR has monitored in the past. Were you looking to include those as well or no, just kind of including all the voluntary wells? Just for um, yes, if we need them. I mean, the one thing I will say about the Western wells is that the cash gem program has a significant number of wells, so we may not need these. These did have uh, some good water level records and Debbie, that's news to me that TID does not monitor these. Um, they are listed as voluntary monitoring wells in the cash gem program. And it was my understanding that that was managed by the monitoring entities in the sub basin. Uh -huh. So 
if it uh, might very well be phyllis it might very well be that i need to coordinate with you on this to to know which ones they are but it could be there were some wells um just perhaps if and i'm just like searching back in my brain for history um so bear with me um but it could be that that some of the wells didn't have all of the necessary data sets that were required to consider them a cas gem well. And if that were the case on the west side, then we might have designated it as a voluntary well. We're, 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 we're monitoring. If it's the TIDs wells that are, that are being monitored, then we're monitoring them. Um, but, but calling them a voluntary well simply because it, it didn't have all of the necessary data to, to characterize it as a a CASGEM well under the CASGEM program um, as we worked through the monitoring program with DWR and their requirements. Yeah. And, well, and that, it, yeah, I, that actually makes a, a, um, good sense to me. Um, that could be the case because I, I did check to make sure that we had construction data for CASGEM wells, but I didn't check for the voluntary wells. So it, that, that certainly could be, and I will, I will check on that. That's good to know. That's a detail I, I need to follow up on. Great, 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 great. Thanks, thanks very much for the feedback, everyone. Um, I'm going to hang with me. I'm just gonna page through the ones that we've already looked at here and get us back to the multi-port monitoring wells, the multi-completion wells. So um, uh, Denaire, the city of Turlock and the city of Ceres all have invested money into uh, relatively deep monitoring wells, dedicated monitoring wells that are completed in various aquifer intervals uh, throughout the entire well. Um, I think these are clusters rather than nested wells so that they are separate boreholes, but they are close to one another. Actually, I think the Denier is a nested well, but I think that the, uh, the uh, other ones are clusters. Nonetheless, they give us an opportunity for monitoring above and below the Corcoran clay. So we have some information here uh, uh, for both uh, principal aquifers. And they um, are, uh, you know, I know in particular, um, Denaires and Ceres were, were installed specifically to look at water quality information with depth. So um, as a result of that, I don't think that they've been monitored regularly for water levels, but they are, assets, I think, uh, certainly assets to the agencies. And it seems to me that they would be also an asset for the GSA if the agencies would be willing to allow access for GSP monitoring. And um, we have some information from those wells, but I don't, I don't have any hydrographs because we don't have the um, you know, so, sort of complete record information uh, I don't think that it's they've been monitored in that manner. Again, they weren't monitored for that purpose. And so um, nonetheless, they give us an opportunity for, you know, monitoring local municipal water supply and also the potential for monitoring the Western Lower Principal Aquifer because we have so few wells uh, anyway to, to do that. So um, I don't have hydrographs from these wells, but I did want to highlight them and also ask um, Denier, the city of Turlock and the city of Ceres to consider uh, the potential for allowing the GSAs to incorporate them into the GSP uh, monitoring network. Moving from those uh, multi-completion wells to USGS wells, there's also uh, some multi-completion wells along the Merced River that USGS installed as well as one well in the East Turlock Subbasin GSA. I don't know the status uh, of these wells and I don't uh, really have uh, good information on whether or not there is some future accessibility of the wells uh, as well. But I wanted to include them because in particular, the uh, clusters that are down by the Merced River might be really good locations to fill in some data gaps that we have in the subbasin. In particular, these are series of shallow wells near the river. So they would give us the opportunity for monitoring interconnected surface water. Uh, and that they, they would be one of the, the I think of, of the wells that I've seen, the, the wells closest to the river and well suited for that. And, and in fact, 
that's exactly what USGS put them in to do. Um, it, it, this was a, a study associated with a, um, a, um, an examination and investigation by USGS to look at interconnected surface water in this area. So um, most of these clusters are actually above the Corcoran clay, but there's one below. So again, it offers an, us an opportunity to see what the potential metric surface is in the Western Lower Principal Aquifer at this location. Again, focused on the data gaps that I know that we're seeing with respect to these two sustainability indicators and this aquifer. So um, I know Lewis? that, yes. Am I Mike Lab? Uh, USGS well there at, near the TSS, that's, um, that's in our program. It's been electronically monitored since uh, 2019. We're using it to watch uh, the nearby pilot study on uh, uh, active dry well recharge. So that it, it's there now, of course, and I've got data for you. That's great. It's GSA 16. Who, does Jewish just still own the well or does the landowner own the well or do you know? Um, um, you know, my understanding is their MO is when they put in a well like that, it is entrusted to the landowner, which yeah. in that case is Merced County, but Eastside Water District now operates it on behalf of Merced County. So it's got our lock on it. It's Excellent. Our well now. Excellent. That's that's wonderful. Thank, thank you so don't, much. Don't I, I tell didn't anybody know. too too many. I guess I've just told everybody. No. We, we've taken it on as our own. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Phyllis, I have been in touch with the USGS on the other two wells. Yes. Um, and I'm still waiting to hear back from them. Um, they've had some staffing changes, and uh, and and he was going to look into it, but but I haven't heard back from him again. I I, I sent him an email earlier this week. Um, oh, good. So, and and it, it, the impression I got from the USGS was that um, that it, it 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 remains a USGS well unless they they hand it back over to the property owner. So um, in a private property owner type perspective, typically they don't like to do that. Perhaps for the county they they have done that. I don't I don't know. So um uh, I could I could let you know if if you're interested, John, um whom at the USGS I've been I've been trying to communicate with, um, if you're interested in reaching out to them on any of that. Um, th that that would be great. I know that this is an ongoing uh, uh uh, investigation that you've been doing. Uh, I know that you had mentioned that you thought that uh, UC Merced or UCS, or some, someone was actually uh, monitoring those wells. Uh, At one point in time, but they, 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 they're not. Uh, okay. This was several years ago, and, and there was some confusion um, with the property owner thought perhaps that, that um, the UC Merced was, was using those wells, and so it took a little while to track down whom at UC Merced was using them, um, yeah. and, and it was years ago, and and it took a while to get back for them to get back to me because of sabbaticals and stuff. So it, yeah, it, it took a bit of time. Um, but uh, as I understand it, 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 the wells are not being used right now. Um, I think the USGS would be amenable to us utilizing the wells, but um, uh, we have to coordinate with the USGS and the property owner so that, that the USGS would retain the well, as I understand it, then um, they would have an agreement with us to enable us to use the well, and we would need an agreement with the property owner to enable us to access the well. Right. So That's a... Easy, but it might work. Yeah. That, that's actually um, better news than, uh, you know, when I had first contacted Steve Phillips about this before he retired, um, he thought that they had been turned over to the property owner. And in fact, he even told me he thought that they'd, they'd uh, tr tractored over one of them, the shallow wells. So, uh, so that's uh, different than what I had heard originally. And that's uh, actually better news, I think, because if USGS still owns the wells, then um, it's just a matter of getting access. Okay. Yeah. If 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 that's the case, I mean, so so that was 
information from C. Phillips before he retired. So, right. so maybe he dropped it down and, and said, no, they still, you know, um, have the wells. Um, or maybe your information is more recent. I, I don't know, because um, he, he never conveyed that to me. Um, but I do think one of the wells was destroyed. I, okay. I have heard that. Yeah. Okay. So I think there's two left. All right. All right. Well, that's that's still that's still good news. Um, it's it's better news than I thought because, um, you know, I I was afraid that USGS was just you know they were just going to bow out of the process and say you know I don't know where those wells are they're not ours anymore good luck. <laughs> but um, but that's that's interesting. Okay, good. That that sounds great. And John, thank you for that information on the Mustang Creek well. I'm glad to hear that that there's a um, opportunity there. I'm just curious, so you're also going to install a TSS well there? Are you going to just screen that one differently? or? The, yeah, because it's a, in a different part of the basin, but also the idea in the TSS is there will be four um, depths of completion there. So I can go into more detail, but it's better if you and I take it offline. Agreed. I, I know Thanks. all of the USGS studies to do with the Lower Merced piece. Mustang Creek became a particular po focus for the entire San Joaquin Valley. So the multi-completion well depth piece you got is part of the overall same study. There are different authors. I've spoken to several of the authors that are not Steve. I did speak to Steve as well. So to the extent it can be helpful, we should have a conversation. Sounds great. Thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so here is a map of the planned future wells, uh, both under the uh, technical support services program, as well as our recently successful grant uh, under Prop 68. And it shows on this map the three TSS wells that um, uh, are being planned, as well as the uh, three Prop 68 wells in the East Turlock Subbasin GSA. And then you can see that uh, we're still nailing down uh, access and locations for wells in the Western Subbasin. Uh, the oval area shown by the, um, the gray line there, that's just a sort of target area. And there have been three potential locations identified within that target area. Two of the three will uh, actually be chosen based on a variety of things, including access. Phyllis, sorry, we yes. don't need to have a private conversation, but first I notice is I'll get, I'll get you the data. We have a fourth TSS location. It's between the Northside Canal and the Merced River. It's down on the bottom bench of the river. So we've got four depth locations going in there. Um, when we couldn't get into one of our electronic monitoring wells because the well aperture wasn't correct, I asked DWR politely if they would do that. Um, they said yes um, about a year ago. Um, the other one is I'm understanding we're, we're trying to get a meeting set with DWR to ask for a TSS support vertical cluster on the east side, uh, west side, excuse me, York, the, the west side. Is okay, that good? I mean, is that meant to be one of these locations? No. Are you sure? No. Yes? No. Well, it no, could that's... be. We don't need to have yeah. a detailed discussion here. I just wanted everyone to be aware we're trying for things that are not yet there. So yeah, we're hopeful that we could use one of the three on the west side um, as a TSS file, potentially. Okay. And then also, we've talked in the past about the need for additional wells along the river to evaluate um, groundwater surface water interaction. And if that were the case, we could request some TSS wells along the, the rivers as well. Um, at least that's, that's some of the conversation that, that has taken place. Sounds good. And um, does anybody know when um, the, uh, um, the, the TSS program is going to be uh, implemented? Any ideas on, on timing of this? For sure, after July 1, it's falling into okay. their next fiscal year. All right. Hoped for by the fall of 2021. Got it. Yeah, fiscal next year. Got mm -hmm. it. Great. Okay, so, thanks very much so for that's that. That's good news. Oh, sorry. I, th I was just going to say that's, that's good news in that it would give us a little bit of time to just identify those additional locations mm -hmm. should we wish to. Right. We'll let you know when we get a date set with the folks. Kevin and I have asked for the date. They've said yes. We just have to calendar it. But I'd like to know going into that meeting with them to discuss TSS where where the west side would like to have a, a vertical cluster so we have some focus to the ask. 
<clears throat> Sounds great. Okay. Okay, so um, based on everything that you have just seen, um, the best hydrographs uh, that would be uh, uh, candidates for the representative monitoring wells are kind of shown here by the green dots. This was just our preliminary selection. There's 35 of those wells. It's a mix of cash gem and voluntary wells, primarily thinking that those were the ones that we had not only access, but also historical information. Now I'm concerned and I have a note down that we need to check on construction information for those as well. Uh, nonetheless, um, it, it shows uh, just, you know, I was just trying to get some kind of a preliminary look of what kind of coverage we have. And it looks like that we've got good coverage. Certainly there's some groupings of wells and we wouldn't need more than one perhaps. And you know, when you see, you know, little clusters of, of wells uh, together here, depending on the, again, the uh, construction information and the objectives of the use of the well and the monitoring program, it could likely be a subset rather than all of these. But it, it gives us some kind of an understanding about where we uh, have some data gaps so we can think about uh, how best to pull everything together and improve it for the future. Um, so thinking about it in this way, I kind of tried to come up with a, a network strategy, um, recognizing that we're going to have wells that you're going to want to monitor for a variety of objectives other than minimum thresholds. Uh, your, your Mustang Creek project is one example. Um, the, um, there's, there's sort of a, an overall strategy that I kind of tried to put together with respect to uh, wells that are representative versus wells that are uh, in the program and in some ways perhaps better uh, monitoring sites, but they just simply lack that historical uh, record. And so I tried to just think about how best to use both of those sets of wells. So obviously, I think the focus should be on anything that can be a dedicated monitoring well, and certainly at least a non-pumping well uh, with both access and historical water level records for the representative monitoring wells. That seems to me based on everything I've heard so far to be the, um, the, the top criteria. And uh, with the caveat again, that maybe some of these voluntary wells need construction information. And then um, to supplement those representative monitoring wells with other wells that are already in the current monitoring program or others that are planned or to be added that could provide improved coverage or easier access or any other preferences such as monitoring uh, the performance of a project under the GSP. And then over time, we can add or uh, replace wells in the water level monitoring program. As the water level records increase over time, uh, you can correlate these back to the existing records from some of the wells and maybe select MTs based on that, even though you don't have the historical record going forward. Uh, it would still give you an opportunity to uh, you know, sort of get rid of the wells that are less helpful and focus on the wells in the program that are uh, better, better sites um, with respect to the objectives of, of them being in the, in the ground as well as using them for representative monitoring wells. And then um, you can just incorporate a management action. I've done this in all the GSPs I've worked on because these monitoring programs are incomplete and not ideal uh, anywhere that I've worked so far. And so just simply incorporate a management action into your GSP that you're going to commit to improving the monitoring network over time, filling in data gaps as uh, funds in, and priorities um, arise. And that gives you the opportunity to do what you want to do with the wells that you want to do them. But it also gives you an opportunity to select reasonable representative monitoring wells for your network. Um, so that's all I have on the monitoring networks and be happy to. I know that uh, John's been very involved in this and we're gonna have some offline conversations, but does any of the TAC members or any member of the public have any other comments on what you've seen so far? Does that make sense what I've laid out? Are there questions? Questions for Phyllis? 
I do have one quick question. Um, sure. This is Natalie with Leadership Council. Um, so in regards to the monitoring network, I, I see why um, you're looking at wells that aren't actively pumping um, to get like a better sense of the, the levels in the aquifer. Um, I guess my, my other, my only question is how um, are the GSAs going to track um, pumping and how that's impacting the, the, uh, the aquifer? Or is that still just gonna be based on those wells that aren't actively um, pumping? So th those wells will absolutely tell you the impacts of the extractions that are going on in the aquifer system. That's the point. That's what we're trying to do with those wells. If you monitor a pumping well and you are seeing a particular well, uh, you, you, are, you are really monitoring the well. You're monitoring the efficiency of that well. You're monitoring uh, how that water level rises and falls within the well casing. And that really has very little to do usually with what's going on in the aquifer. I mean, obviously it mirrors it, but it's, it's very exaggerated. And so these wells away from the pumping centers, just because they're not monitoring a pumping well does not mean that you're not monitoring the effects of pumping on the aquifer. In fact, that's exactly what you are doing. Uh, with these wells. So um, the, the point is not to avoid monitoring pumping. The point is not to establish your monitoring well as a pumping well. Otherwise, all you're doing is trying to figure out well efficiency. And that's really not, uh, doesn't, doesn't have to do with what we're worried about and what we're most concerned about. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. Did, yeah. that, answer your, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Other, other questions on the monitoring well network strategy? Phyllis, I have a, a, a couple. Um, are we looking at spring or fall, or did you mention that and I just missed it? Uh, yes and yes, and I didn't mention it. But semi-annual monitoring will be required so um, we, we want to be able and we need to demonstrate uh, to the Department of Water Resources and our GSP that we are capable of capturing the seasonal highs and seasonal lows associated with monitoring. So spring and fall is uh, preferred and we will uh, you know, want to select the month if possible uh, that, or at least a relatively short period of time in which all of the wells are monitored at the same time. Okay, great. And then the other question is, and, and, and we could defer this to another discussion, but you know, Dennis uh, Yatsuya brought up uh, an email offline after the last meeting about the establishment of the, of the low point or the um, minimum threshold and suggested a, a certain percentage before below the low point is there going to be a separate discussion about that, or is that something maybe the ad hoc committee wants to debate about and then bring back? Yep, you answered your own question. That's right. exactly why. And and I I did respond to Dennis. I appreciate very much getting tech feedback, and I want to encourage it from anyone who ever wants to to provide me with feedback. I I uh, I really welcome that. It helps so much. And the, um, the comment that Dennis had re was with regard specifically to sustainable management criteria. And I actually brought that to the planning group and said, how would you like to handle comments and feedback we're getting in? And the planning group said, great. That's what the ad hoc committee is for. Very good. Thank you. Thank Any you. Any other questions for Phyllis? I, I have one, um, Phyllis. It's just sort of a philosophical question about the heading towards the MTs um, that uh, what there's this, the, the criterion we're trying to metric against is chronic lowering of groundwater levels. So thought on, you might have a mid year uh, distinction of a low water level below uh, your, your spring high, and it could fall below an MT um, number, but it might not be a chronic lowering. Have you have you a thought process on that strategy of is it an episodic low or a chronic low you're trying to get wells established for an MT around? It's a chronic low, and so you absolutely want to see 
um, you know, and, and in this particular case, as the example was the historic low, you would like to be able to demonstrate that that historic low was during a time period when you were at a seasonal low as well. And, right. um, you know, in some cases you have the data to do that. In other cases, the data are incomplete. Nonetheless, it provides, um, you, you see very little, and that's, that's why we'd really like to be able to see dedicated monitoring rails. You see very little movement between spring and fall if it's not a pumping well. It's not, you know, obviously there's some movement, but it's not 50 feet. It's not, it's not the same kind of thing that you see with uh, some of these large fluctuations. So, um, you know, I think that when we set that, we will consider that at each monitoring site. Yeah, I'm, I'm becoming sensitive from listening to the dialogue of the last meeting that, you know, we had up here in San Joaquin County in Linden, wells go dry and they go dry episodically, people deepen their wells. But that's and that is somewhat different than it simply going dry um, in a chronic sense. So you've got you've got two two diff, slightly different issues there to to worry about in the um, the philosophy of setting up what are your metric wells and what are your MTs for those metric wells versus um, dealing with acute issues of somebody's well dehydrating. Well, that's why we've looked at these. Um, historical water level hydrographs for so long now and looked for rates of decline. And that's what we're after here are wells that have a, you know, a rate of decline, a steady rate of decline. So it's not seasonal high and seasonal lows, it's the rate of decline. And, you know, that, that's actually, and just to continue on the thought, that's actually why so many of the GSPs have looked at the historic low water level because we just went through the drought of record. So for most of the Central Valley, we are actually at or near historic lows um, over the last you know, seven years or so. And so that provided you, you know, that's, that, as you recall, that was our first question right out of the box. Um, you know, let's learn from what we have just gone through. We just went through the drought of record, what happened? And uh, what kind of rates of decline did we see? And what adverse impacts did we see? And so that's, uh, that was the reason that we started all of this discussion, you know, back in the spring. Okay, um, if there are no other questions on monitoring strategies, I'm going to move quickly to schedule. And I just have a couple of slides, but they're busy and a little ugly. So I appreci appreciate <laughs> <laughs> holding your comments on that. that. Um, so so um, as, as we have been discussing, so um, we are coming down to the wire here, our last year of putting this plan together. And uh, we've got quite a bit to do yet. It's doable and we plan to do it, but we need to think about how and when, and, and that is what I've been doing. And so, um, and again, trying to think about how everything comes together. So um, this schedule presents a revised GSP schedule, and I wanna go through just a couple of quick points on it. Uh, the first thing I wanna do is go quickly through the bullets, and then we can move back up into the schedule and see what I'm uh, talking about with respect to these points. So this revised schedule incorporates a new review process for the GSP chapters. In particular, I've incorporated an 11 week review process for GSP chapters, including a 30 day comment period. This chapter review process is shown on this schedule by these green bars, and they uh, begin with the technical team providing a draft to the TAC. The TAC has uh, something on the order of a two to three week uh, review period comments come back. We need a week to get those comments in. It goes out for a 30-day review process to the public, comes back from the public with comments. We incorporate those comments and get that chapter ready to roll up into the GSP. So that in brief is that 11-week process. We're going to produce the draft of chapters. I promised them February 1. It is now February 11. I'm pushing that to February 15th, which is Monday, to give me the weekend. We, um, we just had cleanup. We needed not only, we had incorporated 
um, most of the TAC member comments uh, some time ago, but we, as you know, um, had the uh, new section on uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems that we needed to write and incorporate in. And then a lot has happened uh, in the two years or so that we've actually had the draft out. And so um, there's a little bit more cleanup. I need to, to incorporate some additional information on interconnected surface water. So um, that's happening and that's coming next week for TAC review again. You've seen it twice. So I don't think that the review is going to be significant, but you've got time to review it. And then we will have a subsequent public comment period on those chapters. And in particular, that includes hydrogeologic conceptual model, groundwater conditions and the plan area. Oh, and also includes administrative information. The GDEs here are the last component of the groundwater conditions section. Um, the schedule that is shown here also allows the sustainable management criteria to be adjusted uh, during modeling of projects. I have seen this to be helpful. Uh, you are, it, it, it's so hard, I think, to select uh, good sustainable management criteria before you're thinking about how does this work? How is the aquifer going to respond? What are we going to be doing? And so you might find areas where you think, oh, you know, in this area, we need to have uh, different or more wells in our uh, monitoring for sustainable management criteria. So we see here that, that we've got the sustainable management criteria. We need to select that initial sustainable management criteria, which is pretty much most of it through May. And then during this review period, uh, we have uh, the opportunity to adjust based on what we've been doing with respect to the projects and management actions at that time. Um, and then this also uh, allows a process for the member agencies to review the GSP with their local boards and council. And what I mean is that um, member agencies may want to go to their independent boards and councils. It's not an adoption process, so to speak. I mean, the GSAs are the adopting agencies, but um, it could be that um, you know this gives everyone an opportunity to review uh, with their uh, the, the the rest of their agency uh, the details of the GSP and um, you know, gain support so to speak from from uh, the agencies that all participated in the process and then the GSA adoption in early January so that we can get everything together and submit here by January 31st 2022. So those are the key elements. And what you see here is not the entire project. All of the stuff that's already been done, I left off so that we could read the information on this schedule. And this shows sort of where we're headed. Right now, we're finishing up the final water budget modeling. We still have the climate change analysis that's proven to be a little trickier than we thought. And, um, but, but we're getting there. There, there are emails um, going back and forth about things being close to being finalized and the technical uh, modeling team is going to get together uh, with TID who's doing some of the climate change modeling with us um, to make sure that everybody's on the same page next week. Um, once the final water budget modeling is done, um, oh, and there's also the uh, issue of the sustainable yield. Recall we were going to put together an initial sustainable yield analysis. That's still the plan. Um, we're, we have the modeling team dedicated to getting this climate change done now. So the sustainable yield is, is, is out of the box next with respect to uh, this modeling. Recognizing, of course, that the uh, final sustainable yield modeling is done here when we have the uh, projects together. And so that that will fin the, the the initial uh, runs will finish up the water budget section, but the actual sustainable yield runs will be down here with the projects and management actions incorporated uh, into the analysis. Um, the sustainable management criteria, as you know, is going now. Original schedule had us finishing up in February, so um, we are behind. And um, however, we've talked a lot about this and I, I feel like when I talk to TAC members now, um, you know, you've been thinking about it and you have some, some ideas and 
uh, and we're getting more feedback. So I think that's great. And um, I think we can finish this up. Uh, I have it extending through May. It would be great if we finished in early May or late April uh, with, with um, four more uh, TAP meetings um, coming up in April and May. But um, uh, we, we can do it. Uh, we can still do it for there. But I would like for us to start, um, pull, and, and we're continuing to work on monitoring networks. We've done that today. Here we are over here. Uh, and we're going to continue to do that along the process as we begin to see projects and management actions that will also dictate um, uh, preferred monitoring sites for the network. So um, again, we're going to be um, doing several things concurrently uh, through this process. Um, we had early uh, lists of projects, uh, mostly from East Turlock Subbasin GSA provided, and uh, we want to begin to uh, meet on those bones uh, in March. And so um, Woodard and Curran has been tasked with uh, helping to put together the engineering components of those projects, conceptual uh, uh, de designs. And so we will need to get some of that information underway. Uh, and I'd like to start that mid-March. Um, the implementation plan, of course, is the end uh, product of everything that we're putting together here. And then those draft chapters will be reviewed uh, beginning in mid-August going forward. And there's that still that 11-week process that I just talked about before for each of those chapters. The one thing I didn't put on here, and I'm just kind of now seeing that I don't have it on here, I don't, um, is that we're also going to get in May the model documentation. This is something that in particular East Turlock Subbasin GSA has requested. This is something we usually do at the end, um, but uh, um, I am trying to move that up for, um, to, to be sure we get enough review time for that. So um, I'm, I'm pushing the schedule on that and I hope we can get that done in May. Um, let's see, so the, the final GSP can be begin to be compiled and assembled uh, because we will have uh, four chapters, about half of the document done here. And then we will have some kind of an idea about what's shaping up for these draft chapters. At this point, we will have TAC feedback on, on these. And the only thing we will be waiting on are the public comments that will be coming from these chapters to assemble the final draft GSP. I'm sorry, this should say draft. I just realized I made a mistake here and left out the word draft. The, the, this is the final draft GSP. It, it's the final when it's adopted. Um, and the member agencies might want to consider resolutions of support. That might be nice for um, bringing the GSP back to their, again, their boards and councils and then adoption in early January. In the meantime, the technical team will be developing all of the templates and all of the uh, references, which all have to be um, linked online and um, setting up the Sigma portal process for the Turlock Subbasin. And so we'll be doing that in December and January, uh, right before we're ready for submittal. Okay, questions on this schedule. Any questions? Looks like crunch time to me, Phyllis. <laughs> yeah, I agree, Kevin. How can and we help? That's the question. Here, here, is, here is how we can help. Here are meetings. <laughs> so um, so we, we are trying to pull together a lot of coordination here um, in this last uh, eight months or so. Um, what I have shown here are technical advisory committee meetings. The first row are the dates for regular meetings. The second row are dates for special meetings. All of these special meetings have not yet been approved, but um, I put them on the calendar just in case we need them. The uh, ad hoc committees that you just approved today, uh, ad hoc committee meetings uh, are shown on this line. And uh, in 
in concert with what's already been discussed, um, I have pulled in dates of the uh, TAC planning meetings. And so that's what these dates are. This is typically the Monday after the TAC meeting uh, so that we can plan out the um, things that need to be done before the next TAC meeting. Uh, I don't know, I have as needed here. I don't know if we will need all of these, but uh, we are certainly going to need the ones that have been scheduled for March, April, and May. Um, I've also put the GSA meetings because I wanted the opportunity to see when they are so that if there are conveniences that we can, we can consider uh, with respect to the timing of some of these chapters, um, in, in, in other words, to get the cha draft chapters to the GSAs for review and then release for the public comment, um, then, then we can do that. And so um, I have not correlated the, um, the dates of those chapters that you saw on the meeting uh, uh, schedule that you just looked at on the previous slide quite yet with these uh, GSA meetings. Uh, and we will do that uh, sort of as we go. I, I'm going to make a stab at doing that um, in, in advance also just to see how uh, nicely those two meeting schedules mesh now. But um, that, that's something that we'll want to consider. And, and, and I'm sorry I don't have these labeled. The, the first row here are the meetings scheduled for the West Herlux Subbasin GSA. And the second row is the schedule for the East Herlux Subbasin GSA. And um, one of the things that I put on the previous slide that I didn't put on this slide is that all of these are tentative and subject to change. So this is the technical team uh, putting together meetings that are being scheduled by others. And so um, it could be that uh, some of these will be rescheduled. It can be that some of these are actually already known not to be exact dates. So, um, you know, please don't rely on this for uh, your, your, your per personal planning purposes, but um, this is uh, just put together so that I could begin to sort of coordinate how all of the work fits in with those who need to review it. So in addition, okay. That just launches a big fat question for me, I thought to ask, and that's, what do you, do you need a particular level of GSA board level endorsement before you release these chapters for public comment? What's, what's your thought on the process there to get the okay to have them in public review? Yeah, I mean, that, that is the thought. And that's why there, there's an additional, you know, uh, public, I mean, a, 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 an additional time for the TAC review to be able to go to the, each of the respective boards and make recommendations that we're ready for the public review. So yes, um, it's my understanding that the GSAs would release them, not the TAC. Would look to the tax, okay. And you'd look to that GSA endorsement process before you would release it to the public? I yeah, yes, I think so. I mean, it's up to the TAC members as to what they think, but um, that would be my recommendation. Do, does the TAC have comments on that, actually? I should ask this. I've assumed this, but perhaps that's not um, the preference. So, uh, hi, this is Debbie. Um, Thank you, Phyllis, for all of this. This is really helpful for, for me. Um, I, I was hoping maybe uh, Valerie might be able to weigh in on um, the, the proposed review process because um, she was taking a look at the, the regulations and then she developed some, some recommendations for me that I kind of forwarded on to Phyllis regarding um, the TAC reviewing it and then providing a presentation to the board and then the board releasing it for public comment, and then the, the, the board would be reviewing it at the same time, and then um, we compile the comments, um, consider any revisions, and then have another presentation to the board or boards, because um, it would be both East and West. Um, and and um, the GSA would then determine if there's additional changes that need to be made, and then kind of approving the final draft, as I understand it, um, that then would be incorporated into the final draft GSP once that's compiled at the end. Is that is that correct, Valerie, or did I get something wrong? Yeah, no, I, I think that um, is correct. 
I know it's not a terribly straightforward process. It's a little um, kind of of this iterative row, row, row your boat, but we get a chapter that the TAC was comfortable with, brief the board on it, release it for 30 days. The board could give us um, direction and we'll take public comment in that 30 days. And then um, at some point later, we'd issue a final draft. That would be the draft that would be in the final GSP that would be adopted by the board. So every chapter would have a 30 day public comment period, which is more than Sigma requires. But remember that we're getting public comment as we're building these um, chapters to begin with. And it's not really for the board to, to buy off on it because it's an admin draft that we're releasing, but we should brief them ahead of time. For example, if they said, wow, that concept sounds horrible, you shouldn't even release it. And that was the direction that they gave us then we'd be following their direction. So we would brief the board on a chapter and they could say, wow, that sounds like a good approach, release the admin draft for public comment and board direction. Or they could say, no, that sounds like the worst idea ever. We don't even want you to release a public draft, go back and change these fundamental policy things. My sense is it'll be more of the former, um, but yeah. So we would have an admin draft, public comment for 30 days, right after we brief the board on it. And then um, a final draft in the very end that the board could look at an entire package um, and then adoption. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. I have Valerie. a, a so, question. Oh, this, this is yeah, Karen. I thought, I thought we were trying to avoid the very end um, review of the entire document at the very end of the process. Right, we're not taking public that, comment on that. So you have to- Okay, so the- That's right, you give, sorry, Karen, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that's a good point. You give that package to the board and that package should include okay. the review and potentially incorporation and review. I mean, there's a possibility you review public comment and you say, we can't do that, or that's not gonna work for our plan. But the idea is we should review all the public comments, make adjustments, and then give a final draft to the board where the board can give us feedback um, and then adopt that. But remember that that Sigma does require this kind of overall stakeholder incorporation, but it's actual public notice requirements are bizarrely very few. So this is way, way more than Sigma requires us to do. This is way above and beyond. But I think because we need to get, to prove that we got stakeholder input and put it into our plan, that that's kind of my thought is, uh, you know, that a combination, getting that feedback and also getting these chapters to where they're, we can move them out of the constant, um, you know, have something done and we can move forward. I think that, I think everyone's having a problem with that, but I think this basin's having a problem with locking down decisions and moving on. So those are, it's kind of like to kill two birds, I think. Okay. I just thought we were suggesting um, to, you, you've totally made it make sense now. I just didn't want it to end up going back around again for public comment because that would slow things down. So thank yeah. you for clarifying. Sure. Okay, great. Thank you, thank you so much, Valerie and, and Debbie for going through that. That was um, helpful for, for me as well. Um, so I think I've captured that in this, um, this schedule. The only thing that I didn't mention uh, is the interbasin coordination meetings, um, and and I just have them uh, tentatively uh, scheduled on here. And I just put an X. That this is not because I have already contacted Modesto and talked to them about dates uh, or Merced or Delta Mendota. It's it's just thinking in terms of what's happening in the project and thinking what might be the right time to go to each subbasin. Um, because of the interconnected surface water issue, I think we would want to coordinate with Merced relatively quickly in the sustainable management process. And then um, again with Modesto uh, through the sustainable management criteria process, but probably more toward the end. Uh, and then Delta Mendota, there, since there's very little interaction um, of change that we are thinking with respect to even the projected baseline, which doesn't even have projects associated with it, because there's very little interaction with respect to the Delta Mendota subbasin uh, changes over time. 
then I think that's less critical. So I put it at the end, but we obviously still would want to do it. I put it uh, toward the end of the sustainable management criteria process. And then, um, you know, after we have the uh, chapters out for public review, I think it is a good time then to meet with all three sub-basins and review the plan together. So um, that they provided us with that courtesy in Turlock and I'd like to, to do the same for them. So that's all I had for, for schedule. And um, I've got a long list of next steps because I'm kind of, um, you know, every, every time I give a, a, a next step list, then at the next TAC meeting, I go back to my next steps and go, oh, we kind of didn't mention that we were going to be talking about this other thing as well. So I was a little more comprehensive on the next steps here with respect to um, where we're headed. So the GSP chapters are getting ready to be released with respect to the administrative area, plan area, and hydrogeologic conceptual model. The modeling analysis are ongoing for the climate change and the initial sustainable yield scenario. We are working now with the newly uh, approved ad hoc committee uh, to be determined, uh, persons to be determined, and the TAC. And we will continue to share information in bi-monthly TAC public meetings, of course. And then the monitoring network, um, thanks for the participation. We're going to be working with member agencies of both the West and East Turlock Subbasin GSAs on the GSP monitoring network. Appreciate that cooperation. Projects and management actions, we want to continue to develop the list for screening and uh, get ready to do the subsequent analysis. We're going to need for each one of those projects that we've got on the list to assign volumes, uh, timing, and sources of water. So we're going to need um, some uh, meat on the bones, I said earlier, uh, for these projects. Management actions, uh, we've talked about them uh, sort of through the sustainable management criteria process, and we'll continue to flush some of those out. We'll keep a running list of management actions. Um, and then finally, uh, the one thing I didn't put on the um, uh, previous uh, slides is that there will need to be coordination, of course, with the outreach committee on this revised schedule, which includes these GSP chapter rollouts, and using that revised schedule to develop future topics for meetings um, and continuing with the GSP chapter development. Uh, again, uh, looking for appendices for documentation and also appendices for outreach because um, we can start compiling that now and there's no reason not to do that. It's, uh, I know from doing my other GSPs that we always leave it until the end because we keep thinking, well, there's going to be outreach continuing, so we'll just wait until it's over and we'll do it all at once. And, and um, that makes for some really long nights and weekends if you're not careful. So um, we'll, we'll go ahead and start that process now. Why not? And I have a uh, coordination call uh, tomorrow, actually, with some members of the outreach committee to begin to think about that process. OK, thank you all. Um, appreciate uh, sitting through all of these PowerPoints of mine and appreciate all the feedback and looking forward to getting this done. Thank you, Phyllis. Any uh, questions for Phyllis before we let her go? Great. Hearing none, let's move on to item 10, updates. Um, we'll start out with the public outreach update. Herb, are you going to do that? Yes, I have a brief one. It should be pretty quick. Uh, let's see here. I have a couple items. Uh, first thing, um, we worked alongside, uh, we were approached by the Modesto Sub Basin and they developed a joint fact sheet um, with uh, us being that the Turlock Sub Basin and the Modesto Sub Basin have a lot in common. And so we worked with members of Sturgba uh, or, you know, and worked with them and a joint fact sheet was developed and they're sending out uh, outreach materials today re related to it. And I told Gordon from MID that uh, we would do the same. So as such, I have posted this spreadsheet uh, or sorry, the fact sheet on our resources page, uh, the Turlock Groundwater Resources page. Uh, so if you just click resources when you're on our site, you'll find it next to our other fact sheets. Um, and I encourage everyone to take a look at that. It's got a lot of good factual information and they sought our, um, our opinion on it as well. 
Um, so that's out there. Um, second item here is um, uh, I actually was on a call today with um, uh, a woman who's helping out um, with the Valley Water Collaborative Outreach efforts. Many of you are familiar with following up on CV Salts. We've talked a lot about that in this group. Um, they have a comment period going on right now. And I told them I'd put a plug out there because there's a lot of overlap between groundwater um, issues and, and um, the, the nitrate issues um, that they're working on with the regional board. And so um, their um, preliminary management zone proposal and early action plan is actually on the street for public comment uh, through, I believe, the 22nd of this month. So two more weeks left to go. But I just encourage everybody um, to visit valleywaterc, as in cat, dot org. They didn't want to spell out collaborative all the way. It'd be a long URL. So valleywaterc.org. Um, and so I told them um, they, there's a lot of overlap in us trying to reach to certain people in the Turlock subbasin and them trying to outreach to um, everybody within the boundaries of their um, tier one and tier two management zones or their the tier one management zone, which includes the Modesto subbasin for their efforts. Um, so that's that on that item. I figured I would share that with the group. Um, and then um, the last thing is, um, you've heard about it for a, a little bit, but nothing recently. Um, the, the Environmental Defense Fund and RCAC, um, an organiza two organizations that have worked up and down the past couple of years in the Valley to hold leadership institutes. Um, they have held one in Visalia a couple of years back and then um, one in Imperial Valley as well. Um, they've been working with us for, um, I want to say, more than a year and a half um, to develop one for the Turlock Subbasin, um, and um, they're continuing to work uh, on things, and they're looking to have an April cohort launch of some 20 people or so um, to attend this Leadership Institute virtually, um, and um, they are looking at a, a March timeframe for uh, recruiting um, and and going uh, into some sort of application period. Um, and so um, their goal is to teach people about water issues, including groundwater issues, and to continue to work with the Turlock Subbasin representatives. And they, um, they're they working really quick on that. Um, uh, if you remember, they wanted to do it not virtually um, a year or so ago, and then things happened with COVID. So they kind of had to shift gears, and now they'll be holding a virtual one. And so um, more information I'll be providing on that. Um, they're still in the process of how to outreach and they would look to us to come kind of pass along information to get people interested as we've been on our outreach efforts um, since 2014, since Sigma was passed. So that's that item. Um, and I think those are the only three things I have. So I just wanted to provide those as updates to the group and I'll provide continual updates the next time we meet. Thanks Herb. Uh, any questions for Herb and the outreach group? Hearing none. Uh, Debbie, are you going to do the update on the grants? Yes, thank you, Kevin. Um, I just have a short update on, on the grant. Um, uh, Phyllis gave a really great update on where we are with the, the, the GSP and the schedule and that sort of thing. Um, the only other thing I want to say with that, that, that particular grant, because that's our first grant, right, um, is that uh, we are due very soon to send out our next invoice and progress report to uh, DWR, and so we'll be working on that as well. Um, for our second grant, which includes um, the PEIR, the wells, and um, the groundwater recharge assessment tool development. Um, Phyllis also gave a really great update on where we are with um, uh, with the the wells component. Um, the west side is is finalizing their locations, and and the east side um, has already identified them. But um, they are, as I understand, going to work on obtaining the access agreements. Um, and as we as will we once we identify the final location and then um, the technical team is preparing to do um, the technical work to be able to go out for bid um, in March, April. So they'll be developing the technical technical documents that will go into the bid process and then um, we'll go out to bid 
and um, determine which uh, which driller we want to work with, and then hopefully the drilling would start in the the June July timeframe, and um, perhaps even as early as May. It depends on how quickly we can get through this whole process. So that's the plan with that. Um, and then um, the last component is the, the groundwater recharge assessment tool. And uh, the consultant team working on that should be reaching out to each of uh, the agencies and um, gathering information and details on um, what the individual agencies see as far as potential projects to incorporate into the tool and facilities and information. and um, and so if they have not reached out to you, please let me know. Um, I want to, uh, I'm going to speak with Glenn um, later this week, early next week about where we are with everything, but, um, but that's where they're, they're focusing right now. We have so many individual agencies that it's, it's difficult to do it all in one big session. And, and so they want to be able to reach out to each individual agency and, and get their feedback and, and, um, and answer any questions that they might have because everyone has slightly different systems and um, information and that sort of thing. So, um, that's what I have by way of a, an update. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Debbie. Any questions for Debbie? Quick one, Debbie, that I've asked before, but the PEIR part of the final grant, when is that going to occur? The second grant? We say? have. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I just was clarifying. Hopefully it's not the final grant, but it's the second grant. It is the second grant. Um, and we do have the consultant on board. Now that we are ha have a, a kind of a more detailed uh, schedule, we're going to work with her. We were waiting until we had that in place before we circled back to her and, and started talking about how best to engage her in the process. We wanted to make the best use of her time. And um, uh, some of this uh, is more policy preliminary type stuff. Um, she's going to be more engaged as we get into implementation and projects and those types of things. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's in play, but we haven't um, uh, triggered it quite, quite yet. Thank you, John. Any other questions for Debbie? Any other updates from the, the, the other agencies? Hearing none. Uh, Karen, anything on your agenda you want to mention? Um, I don't have anything. OK. Well, our next meeting will be um, the 25th. So I guess we need uh, motions uh, from the east side. I'll start with the east to adjourn. Kevin, I'll move to adjourn on the east. This is Brody. Thank you, Brody. A second, please. Yes, I'll second. Thank you, Dennis. The east side is adjourned. Uh, Karen? Can I get a motion to adjourn the west side, please? I'll move. This is Debbie. And a second? I'll second, Miguel. Thank you, Miguel. So I think we're, we've adjourned both west and east now. So uh, thank you all for your participation today. Look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks. <laughs>